to Romans chapter number 4. And our focus tonight will be on verses 16 through 25 as we look at God's provision for our salvation, God's provision for our salvation. Now, the common denominator in all of the false religions of the world is that they were founded by uh, men upon the works of men. In other words, works, a works-based salvation. Lost man must do something to earn the forgiveness of, his, of God, and, um, and they must do something to earn their acceptance with God. Even many Christians say that uh, they're saved by the grace through faith. They accept that premise. Well, I'm saved by grace through faith. But then they live as though they're trying to show God by their good works that they really weren't that sinful at all. They, they really should not have taken the death of Jesus Christ to pay for their sins. I mean, they obviously, they're not sinners like other folks. Uh, and considering everything they've done for the Lord since they were saved, they think they deserve to be saved, or at least they deserve it better than anybody else. And at least they want God to know that He didn't waste His grace upon them. His grace was not wasted upon them. So, but in Titus chapter 3, verse 5 through 7, is one of the verses that the New Testament church, the true evangelical church, is based upon. It's this. The Bible assumes we're saved. It says we're saved not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost, which He shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's one of the basic cardinal uh, verses of an evangelical church. The paraphrase of that passage reads this, He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. And because of His grace, He declared us to be righteous. He declared us to be righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Picture yourself in an ocean, if you will, tonight, just right there in the middle of an ocean. You're about 90 miles off the shore. Your boat is sunk. You have no food, no water. Uh, you're clinging to a little piece of wood for your very life. And as far as you can see, no one is coming to help. You're there, you're there, and you're there. Then out of the blue, there's a splash of water and a life raft appears right in front of you. You reach out, you grab it with both hands and rejoice and weep at the same time as you're pulled to safety and the security of a huge ship. Well, let's suppose you were telling the story to your children, but you changed some of the events just a little, just a little bit here to kind of give a works-based salvation, all right? Yes, you were holding onto that piece of wood for dear life, while the waves were getting higher and stronger, you had no idea which way you were drifting. Your lips were parched. Your face was burned for the sun. Your legs were about to give out in the ocean. And uh, you just knew that you were going to die right there. And when you all of a sudden you heard the splash of that raft. But then your story turns to what you did. Uh, you grabbed the life raft. You grabbed onto the rope. You pulled yourself up the, by the boat to that boat, rather. You pulled yourself up into the boat. You saved yourself from drowning because you reached for that life raft. No, my friend, you didn't. This isn't how it worked. Here's what you should have told your children and your grandchildren. This is it. And you sang it a moment ago. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. Watch it now. Sinking to do what? Rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could work. There was nothing else around. Love lifted me. That's the story of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We should never do or say anything that would in any way diminish the work of God and the power of God's saving grace in our lives. Let's, let's don't take any credit for it whatsoever. Because if, it, if we had a God thought, it was God who put it there. Because we're not godly enough to have a godly thought without God's work in us. Now, we should never do anything to say that would in any way try to shift the glory of our salvation from the price Jesus paid for it upon that cross 
to our personal, feeble, often fickle religious efforts. To do so would evidence our ungratefulness at best and maybe our unregenerate nature at worst, meaning taking God's grace for, for granted. Either way, it destroys our testimony, it destroys the witness, and it negates the power of God that God gave to us for our salvation. The prophet Jeremiah put it this way, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindnesses, justice and righteousness on the earth for I delight in these things now that's the new American standard version your Bible may look, read it differently there it's Jeremiah 9 23 and 24 Jeremiah 9 23 and 24 and the Apostle Paul summed it up in this way let him who boasts boast in the Lord so if we are saved tonight and we want to boast about it to whom should we give the credit to the Lord God Almighty amen we're saved by his grace through our faith, and even that faith is not, a, not a, of us. It too was a gift of God. Let's would boast about that faith. And that's where we are tonight. So even while all the Apostle Paul had accomplished in, as an apostle, spreading the gospel around the world, in fact, I would say tonight, you and I are in this room because the Apostle Paul was obedient to the vision God gave to him to get the gospel to the Gentiles. He chose not to, not to boast in his work, and if anybody could have boasted, it probably Paul, <laughs> he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But if you, if you hear Paul boast about anything, he boasts about the grace of God and the grace of God that, that was performed in his life to save him from his sins. No matter what good we've done on earth, we're still sinners. We're begging for the mercy of God to forgive us of our sins. Salvation then, salvation then is must be, it, mu it cannot be anything else but the free gift of God, orchestrated completely by God and for the glory of God. Otherwise, Somewhere along the wayside, somebody's going to get some credit. And I think, I think the loving God, the loving Father, is due all the credit and all the honor and all the glory for that. God threw out the lifeline of his grace. We grabbed the hold of it by faith. And again, even that faith was not of ourselves. It too was a gift of God, not of ourselves, lest we'd boast about the amount of faith. And you hear some of these people all the time. I mean, they, they, when they start out with their testimony, it, it's like they gave up so much in the gutter. They were, they were living in the gutter of life. But, oh, I, look, look, I gave up so much of the gutter here, and I just reached out and grabbed the hold of God. Well, now, which one do you like best, the gutter or the grace? To whom do we give the grace, greatest glory? The gutter where we lived and, and was about to die, or the grace of God that reached down in the gutter of life and, and brought us out? We need to think about that thing. Every time we lay our head on a pillow at night, we need to say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for the next word. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Amen. The truth is, folks, we had no other place to go and no other way to be saved except through Jesus Christ. As Peter said in the book of Acts, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. Acts 4.12. And then in John 14.6, Jesus himself said it very clearly, I am the way. The truth and the life. Now watch this next line because we say it glibly. No man cometh to the Father. Next lines. Except by me. But by me. And so with that basis now, the only thing we can boast about is what? The only thing we should boast about tonight is that we're saved by the grace of God and that we can know the one who saved us because he wants us to know him. He wants us to know everything about him. The whole Bible is about God's plan of redemption. If you try to read it with any other purpose, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You get lost in the begats and the begats and the begats and the begats if you don't understand that the whole plan of redemption is about those begats. Someone said we could cut the Bible to any page of the book and it would bleed the saving blood of Jesus Christ. And at least the premise of that is true. I understand, I think it was W.A. Christopher who said there's a thin red line to the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And there is. In the Old Testament, Christ is predicted. In the New Testament, Christ is revealed. In the book of Acts, Christ is preached. In the epistles, Christ is explained. In the book of Revelation, Christ is revealed. And the center focus of the person of Jesus Christ on the cross, where Jesus paid the price for our sins. That, the Old Testament looks forward. The New Testament looks backward. 
And there's not another book in the Bible, there's not another book in the world that explains God's gift of salvation any better than the book of Romans. Now some people want to start out in John, that's fine. I understand it because it focuses on Christ. But I'm telling you, if you want to understand your salvation, just dwell in that book of Romans, and, uh, which was written in, by Paul in about uh, AD 60. AD 60 would make it about 50 years after the resurrection of Christ, somewhere in that neck of the woods. So this one book provides a massive yet um, basic theological framework for the whole collection of apostles, the apostles' writings. And it's the outline by which he used to, to write the other epistles and the theological background that he used in writing the other epistles. So you recall what the apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel at all. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. For it, the very gospel itself, is the power of God. Let me read that to you one more time. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So you may have heard the gospel from your mother, father. You may have heard the gospel from some preacher, evangelist. You may have heard the gospel from a missionary, a teacher, whatever the case might be. But it was not the person who uttered the gospel. It was the power of the gospel that was uttered. And you had faith in that gospel. And what's faith? Faith is taking God at his word and, in, and doing something with it. And so when you heard the Word of God, you believed it was truth, and you acted upon that truth, and that's mine and your part of God's plan of our salvation. Now most commentaries agree <clears throat> that verse 16 and 17 of chapter 1 are a concise summary, if not um, of the content of um, the whole book of Romans, but it's a summary of Paul's theolo theology regarding God's plan for salvation. Now here's what you have to do if you want to get really serious about it. You want to take Paul's book of Romans and dissect it, outline it if you will, about salvation, God's plan of redemption. Go back in the Old Testament see if it fits. Because you see Paul knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. And so he was probably the one that that was the reason God chose him because he was the Jew of Jews. He went all the way back to to, to Moses and forward. And so when it came down, oh, I understand, now he understands all of these things. And he put all that together in this theological treatise called the book of Romans. His main concern was that his readers understand how a sinner can be made righteous by his faith in God and how a justified sinner should then live each day for the glory of God. And you see, that's where if we take any credit at all for our salvation, then we are diminishing the glory of the God who, claimed, who came up for the whole plan of redemption. Where it, where if God had not come up with this plan, where would we still be? We'd be like in the old book of, the, of, of Genesis up to, chapter, up to chapter 6. There was no law. There was no moral law. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes, and we're pert near there again. In the first four chapters of Romans, the apostle Paul established every man's need for a Savior. Every man. And he talks about this group of people, that group of people, and the other group of people. But he said, all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In chapter 1, verse 18 to 320, Paul showed the sinfulness of man. Every man is a sinner by nature and by choice. Nobody is left out. We all are born in that, with that sin nature. And therefore, we need a Savior. Chapter 321 through 521, Paul showed the solution to man's sin. And the only solution to man's sin what God has done to forgive us of our sins and to make us acceptable unto God, it's called justification. And, and it's amazing to me that, uh, that we make so little out of that because what the Bible says, once we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, it's just as if we had never sinned. I, I, still, I still can't get over that. It still blows my mind, literally, how we can, we can say that and, and not really understand it. It's just if we'd never sinned. That's how clean we are before the Lord. Now, that's not how clean we are, but that's how clean we are before the Lord when he, when, when he imputes the righteousness of the Holy Son of God into the likeness of us, that we're, it's just if we'd never sin. You can't get over that. You'll never get over that. I hope you never get over that. But the good news, God has provided salvation. God has provided righteousness. God has provided redemption through one person, through Jesus Christ and to those who will simply receive his gift of salvation. Last week I offered Mr. Moore that pen, and I just offered it, and he came up and took it. And that was a gift. I took it back because I love my pen. 
But anyway, it, it was an example of, of God extending His grace to us, and all we're doing is receiving His gift of grace. Chapter 3, Paul stated the teaching of salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. It had to be this way. It had to be this way. Why? So that God's gift of salvation would not only be available to everyone, but it would also be accessible to everyone simply by their faith alone. Uh, we need to sing that song uh, more and more by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Chapter 4, Paul illustrated the teaching of salvation through the life of Abraham. So we come back now to our Bible study. Abraham was not chosen <clears throat> of God to be the father of the nation of Israel <clears throat> because of who he was or what he did or why he did it. And yet there are millions of people who believe that. Abraham did one thing. He took God at his word and he loaded the camels and literally put them in the wind. He took God at his word. He trusted. He believed. He fleshed out his faith in God. And that expressed faith was counted unto him as if he was as righteous as God himself. That expressed faith. In chapter 5, Paul demonstrates the teaching of salvation through the outpouring of God's love. The very moment we reach our hand of faith out to take hold of God's gift of grace, the love of God is poured out into our hearts. So how can you determine tonight if you're truly born again? Has the love of God been shed abroad in your heart? Now, James says it very clearly, you know, one well cannot give two, two different tastes of water. You can't get bitter water and sweet water out of the same well. And so if the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart, then there's no room in your heart for hatred. There's no room in your heart for even selfish love or, or uh, the love of, of the flesh because it's been replaced with the love of God. And as Peter said, uh, to told Jesus that day, uh, Jesus, Lord Jesus, if, you, if there's any love in my heart for you, you know it because you put it there. I, I proved myself that I, didn't, I don't know how to love you. But if you'll love, if you'll love through me, I will let, I'll let my life be a channel of your love to others. But before we begin tonight, let me ask the question, why would God use Abraham? Because Paul's purpose in writing this letter was to convince those Jews who had accepted Christ as their Savior that while Abraham was a great man, and he, didn't want to, he did not want to diminish Abraham in their eyes at all, God did use him in a mighty way. He was more than a father of the Jews, the nation of Israel. He was also the father of the faithful. And I think we can also just take it out. We can almost take that out. Yes, he was the father of the Jews, but in reality, he was the father of the faithful, including the Jews. Abraham was the first man who was justified before God. He was the first man in the Bible to be justified before God simply by his faith. So in chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, in using the life of Abraham, Paul said our salvation is by faith and not by works. Now, I hope you get this tonight, and I kind of hope it keeps you awake all night because you need to grab a hold of this. It's going to change your life a little bit. In chapter 4, verses 9 through 17, and still using the life of Abraham, Paul shows us that our salvation comes by grace and not by the law. In fact, the Mosaic law had not been, even been established when God called Abraham to leave his home and his family and to follow where he would lead him, and that included the rite of circumcision that God established to identify them, the Jews, as his chosen people. None of that had been put into place. Now, the text before us tonight, in verse 17 to 25, Paul says our salvation comes then by divine power, not by human effort. And that's where I've been trying to get in this lengthy introduction. Our salvation is by God's divine power, from radiator cap to tailpipe, and not by human effort. Salvation must be all of God and all for God's glory, or it's not according to his plan of salvation at all. It's just religion. So, Let's look at this tonight in, uh, in, in, in Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 17 to 25. And first of all, look at verse 17 at the source of Abraham's faith. Now, today, even many believers, we hear a lot about hope and we hear a lot about faith, but there's a tremendous difference between hope and faith. Hope is the desire for something to happen. It's wishful thinking based upon the ability of man to make it happen somehow, some way, and we, we have hope 
that things will be different tomorrow. We have hope that our loved one is going to get better tomorrow. We have hope that some of the problems we're facing will be finished or, or fixed tomorrow. Faith, though, is different from hope. Faith is a confident assurance that it will happen because it's based upon God's divine power, not upon man's ability. So hope is one thing. Hope is, is hoping it will happen, but we're not sure of that. But faith is the assurance, it's the confidence of the assurance that it will happen. And here's the basis of that. It's because God has the only power to make it happen. Abraham exercised his faith, and the source of that faith was in God himself, the very God who quickened the dead. He quickened the dead, the omnipotent God who had the power to breathe life into dead matter. Remember, Adam lay there until God breathed life into his dead body. And every breath that we take is a gift of God. Uh, otherwise, when we stop breathing, you know, the, the gift ceases. But every breath we take in is another gift of God, just as if God was blowing his breath into, the, into Adam's, Adam's nose there. And so the very God who created everything that is out of nothing, he spoke it into being, and it was. And so Abraham trusted and believed in this God who spoke everything into being, and it was. He said, let there be, and there was. And you can fill in the blank there. And so he believed that God would keep his promise because God had proved himself to be that powerful before Abraham. Therefore, the source of Abraham's faith was in God himself, not some hope that was going to be different tomorrow, but that God himself would do what he said he would do. Again, faith is taking God at his word and then acting upon it. Now let's go back and fill in the storyline here because we need to see why Paul would bring this up to the Jews. God came to Abraham and told him, look, you're going to be the father of many nations. Now, yet Abraham didn't even have a son, um, not by Sarah at least, and he was already 99 years of age, and, so, and Sarah was about 90, not quite in childbearing years as we might say today. So Abraham realized if he were ever going to have a son, it would have to come from God because there is no way that grandpa and grandpa, are going to, and that these old people are going to have children here, that it was impossible for, for man to do so Abraham believed that if it was necessary for the fulfillment of God's promise, that God would have to create life in the organs of his and Sarah's bodies, just as he did when he spoke creation of the being. Now look at this man's faith. Okay, he's 99, she's 90, ain't like that they're going to have a child. So if it's to be, that it has to be of God. Only God has the power to stir the organs of a male and a female body of that age and to bring new life from that life, from their life. So the source of Abraham's faith was God himself. But look in verse 18 to 22, and we'll see the strength of Abraham's faith. Now, verse 18 describes the strength of Abraham's faith in what God had said. Read it again with me. Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Now go back with me in your mind in Genesis 15, 5. The Bible says God told Abraham to look up and count the stars in the sky if he could. And God said, Abram, so shall thy seed be. How old is he? How old is she? Think about that. And Genesis 15, 6. Look at this now. And we read these precious words. And Abraham believed in the Lord. Look up in the sky, Abraham, and if you can count all those stars, that's how many children you're going to have. Lord, you sure about this? He didn't question it. Abraham, in verse 15, verse 6, rather, of, of Genesis 15, and Abraham believed the Lord. I don't know how it's going to work. That's not my pay grade. It's above my pay grade. If God said it, I believe God's going to do it. He has the power to do it, and I'm going to take him at his word. Now, up to this point, all Abraham had was Ishmael. The works of his own flesh, a son, life from his loins, yes, but not the son that God promised him, not the life of God's promise. So all Abraham had left was his faith in what God said. And so he put his faith in God's promise. It was not a hope so. It was a no so based upon his faith in the promise and the power of God. Now, this is there's an interesting story here about Abraham. We don't often hear this. 
um, but it serves as a, to strengthen the point of the sermon. So let me share just the tidbits of it with you. Before God changed his name, Abraham was called Abram. You, you remember that. And uh, he was what is known as an oriental man, a rich man who lived along the road where the caravans traveled between Egypt and the north and the east. And so in Genesis 13, 2, we read where these caravans would stop at Abram's wells and uh, where he and his family would take care of their animals and fill them up with water like you'd fill up a car with gasoline, provide food and lodging for the merchants as they would rest before they would go on their journey. And just before dark, the merchants would come to Abram's tent to settle up their charges and to pay their respects to the family for the service and whatever. And they would ask him questions about his family and his heritage and, and of course, his name. Now, we don't, we don't understand this because our names don't mean as much today as they did in that day. But Abram, they would say, now, Abram, um, uh, what, what's your name? Well, my name is Abram. And they knew that Abram in that era meant the father of many. Hold on to this. And so the merchants would say, oh, so you're the father of many? Uh, uh, Abram, how many do you have now? And Abram would say, none. And the laughter would begin. The whole merchants would laugh. Okay, you'll be the father of many. You're getting kind of old here. How many do you have now? None. Abram and Sarah heard this many times. Each time it brought a weight of sadness to both of them. Obviously, they didn't know, understand what was going on, but they still believed God. So now, now you know, as folks in that day lived, they lived in these goat hair tents. And if you've never been in one, it's hot as blue blazes. It stinks to high heaven. But there was very little privacy at all between families. And no doubt, this hurtful humor was shared between everybody who heard it. Abraham, Abraham, you're going to be the father of, of many. You're going to be a father. Well, you're going to have that many children. How many do you have now? None. Poor old Abram and Sarah. Wonder why they can't have a baby. Wonder which one of them is sterile. You can hear the gossip, gossip, gossip going from tent to tent to tent. Abram had a multitude of cattle, a multitude of servants, but no children. He couldn't even live up to his name, Abram, the father of many. Now, this, is no, this in no way justifies Sarah's actions, but you understand why she came up with the idea that Abraham should go into her servant girl, Hagar, and let her conceive so that at least his virility would not be in question. And we know what happened. Everyone then knew, okay, it's Sarah's problem then. It's Sarah the reason they can't have any children. And so she felt even more despised than she was before because in that day, if a woman didn't bear a child, well, they, she was made fun of. Finally, at the age of 86, Abram had a son, and he begged God to let Ishmael be the seed of his family. But God said, no, that boy was produced by his own natural powers. The work of man, something of man is in this process. We've got to get man out of this process here. So that's a son of the flesh. So it's, it's the son of Abraham, but it's the son of the flesh. Abram, the life I want to produce through you will not be from your flesh, but it will be through your faith in me. Not something you do, but it will be something I do through you. Go with me on that? Say Amen. Thirteen years later, Abram is 99, Ishmael is 13. God came to him and said he was going to give him another son. And the son, could never, the, the son he could never produce in and of himself. And God said, oh, by the way, I'm changing your name. No longer will you be called Abram, the father of many. Now you're going to be, you're going to be called Abraham, the father of multitudes. Whew. And can you guess how the evening conversations began to change? It was 25 years from the time God first promised Abraham a son until the son came. Abraham was strong in the faith. Some people pray and they believe for something, maybe for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe in a couple of months. And then they give up. They give out. They give in. But uh, like Sarah, they try to accomplish God's will in the flesh so that God won't be embarrassed. We can, uh, we can just do this in the flesh. But for 25 years... This man remained strong in the faith. Why? Because he believed in God who could give life to the dead, who could call things which are not as though they were, and he had the confidence that what God said he would do. He was a man of faith. For 25 years, Abraham refused to look at the obstacles. He refused to look at his, at his natural limitations. 
that both he and Sarah were well beyond the age of bearing children. This just didn't happen. He believed the same God who created everything that is out of nothing could also work a miracle in and through them. Abraham lived his life believing what God said was so, knowing that one day he would make it so. Is that where you are in believing God tonight? Is that where you are on your level of faith in God? For 25 years, Abraham refused to look at the odds. Abraham knew he was weak in the body, but in verse 19, Abraham was not weak in his faith. You see, we can be weak in our body, but not weak in our faith. We can be strong in our faith. What are the odds that a 99-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman can have a baby? What are the odds of that? Even Abraham and Sarah both laughed when they first heard it. Remember that? Genesis 17, 15. God told Abraham, Sarah, you, Sarah is going to have a child. And the Bible says Abraham fell on his face and he laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And Sarah said, that's 90 year old, that, uh, that, that there's a 90 year old to bear a child. Can, is that possible? And they both laughed about it. Genesis 18, 9 through 15, when Sarah heard God tell Abraham that she was going to have a child, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have the pleasure of my Lord being, uh, having a child? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for God? So at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. That laugh was doubting God. That laugh was to say, it ain't going to happen. Abraham laughed with joy. Sarah laughed in doubt. Abraham laughed that he was going to have a son. Sarah laughed in doubt that it would ever happen. She doubted God's promise, which is why she gave Hagar to Abraham. In essence, she failed to trust God completely. She tried to do God's work in man's way. But when we turn to the Hebrews' hall of faith, here's what we read. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and of him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore. In other words, innumerable. So Sarah here in Hebrews is saying it happened. It happened. They had as many children as the stars in the sky and the sand of the sea. Once Sarah gave birth to that son, she was no longer relying on Abraham's faith. She was resting on her own faith in God's promise. So God used this to encourage Sarah's faith. No, Abraham did not consider the obstacles or the odds. Abraham resolved to keep his eyes on the promise. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God. He staggered not at the promise of God. And the word stagger there means to waver. He didn't have faith one day, lose his faith the next day. His faith was constant. He kept on trusting the God who'd made the promise. He didn't trust in the promise, he trusted in the, God, in, the, in the God who made the promise. Abraham resolved to look at the performance, verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Do you believe that whatever you're holding out in faith tonight, God can do? I, I have to believe it. I have to believe it every day, in every way. So Abraham was fully convinced of God's ability and God's power. He didn't know how he was going to do it. Again, he didn't have to. That's not up to us how God does it. But he did know, he did know that God who was going to do it, and whatever, God could do whatever he promised to do, and then his faith was credited to him as unto righteousness. Now that faith, again, it's more than hope. It's more than this willy-nilly faith. It's got to be serious faith. God, I know that you're the God who can do this. You've made everything out of nothing. You said let there be light. There's light. You said let there be this. There's, it's here. You created everything with a purpose, and the purpose is being fulfilled. You created everything with a system, and the system has worked for thousands of years. You've done more in six days than we've done in 6,000 years. God, I believe that you can do anything you choose to do. How many of you believe that tonight? That God can do whatever he chooses to do. He has the power to do whatever he chooses to do. Look at, look at the verse uh, 20 through the 25, the significance of Abraham's faith. 
Now the Jewish Christians held Abraham in high regard because he was the father of their people. They were in fact a part of the fulfillment of God's promise, and they were part of God's process and plan and picture of our redemption. But Paul is showing them, and now it was, there was another reason why Abraham's life story was recorded for all of us to hear and then to read. And according to verse 23 and 24, that was so that all men might believe or have the same kind of faith as did Abraham. Faith must have an object or it's just hope. It's just hope. And just as Abraham's faith was fixed on the promise of God, our faith must now be fixed upon the fulfillment of that promise, not in Isaac, but in Jesus. Jesus, the one through whom God said all the nations of the earth would be blessed. In other words, he told Abraham, okay, Abraham, you're going to have a son, and uh, uh, your seed in your seed, uh, through the son that was in your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. It wasn't Isaac, it was Jacob. I mean, it was Jesus. And so God said, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so the one who died for our sins and the one who was raised for our justification came from the seed of Abraham. Notice in verse 25, Paul said Jesus was delivered for our offenses. Paul knew who really crucified Jesus. It was our sins. Yes, the Jewish religious leaders wanted him crucified out of their way. Yes, the Roman officials carried it out because they were in authority over the Jews. They wouldn't let the Jews carry out capital punishment. But the truth is neither group crucified Jesus. They were just pawns in the hands of our sovereign God. It was God himself who crucified his own son to be the Savior of our, from our sins. And according to Isaiah 53, 10, the Bible says, it pleased the Lord to, to bruise Jesus. I have a hard time reading that. It, 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 I have a hard time understanding. It pleased the Lord to bruise his only son. Uh, a writer said the other day, God would rather see his son die on the cross than to see Wayne live in sin. And boy, if that doesn't keep you from sin, nothing else will. God himself said, I would rather see my son dying on the cross than Wayne living his life in sin. In Acts 2, 23, the Bible says Jesus was delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Jesus wasn't just a martyr in the wrong place at the wrong time and got convicted and crucified for no reason. No, he was, it, he was delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was planned in the counsel of the Godhead even before the foundations of the world came into being. Sure, the hand of wicked men carried it out. But even before time began, for us, God determined his son was going to pay the price for our sins by his death on the cross right there in the city of Jerusalem, which is why that place is still so hated today, loved and hated by both. God delivered Jesus to that cross, but Jesus died on that cross for our offenses. He took my sins and my sorrows, and he made, him, he made them his very own. We put him on that cross, yes. But God determined that that would be satisfied for, for our sins. But if, if, if all you have is a dead Savior hanging from a cross, you don't have anything but a dead religion. I, I don't understand our Catholic friends. Every time you see a cross, you see him still on the cross. He's not on the cross, folks. He's not in the grave, folks. He's back, at the, he's back sitting at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says we must center our faith on the Lord's crucifixion and his resurrection. Look at verse 24 again. If we believe on him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. All right, here's where our faith has to come in. We're in the same place Abraham was. Abraham believed that even though his body and Sarah's body were both dead, God could bring forth life out of those two dead bodies. And if you and I are to be saved today, we must believe that not only did God bring forth a son from Mary's womb, but he also brought forth his only begotten son from death's cold tomb. And the Bible says if we truly believe that, we can be saved because that's what's happened to us when we are saved. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, unable to bring forth new life. Did you get it? Did, you, did the light come on here at all? Can you say amen to that? Do you understand? We just, we're just like uh, these two people. So God quickens our dead spirits. He breathes new life into our soul, and we're born again. 
We're born again just like Adam was born the first time. New life is brought forth from that which is dead in sin. Not by human effort, not by religiosity, but by God's divine power. And that divine power is ours by faith alone in Christ alone. Now I feel in my heart tonight, there may be some here who've never experienced that full faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Yeah. It's hard to say that to a Sunday, a Sunday night crowd today. I know you love the Lord. I know you love God. You love this church. You wouldn't be here. But if you've got some unconfessed sin in your heart, listen, um, you need to get that out. Why? That's holding you back from the true intimacy with God the Father. You're saved, perhaps. We don't know that for sure. Only God knows that for sure, and only you. But um, you're not prepared to stand before him tonight. If you have anything in your heart for, against others or against somebody else tonight, get rid of that because it's robbing you of the joy that Jesus died to give to you. Now, listen, if you've never professed Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're out there in that ocean. You're out there in that ocean of life and you're sinking deeper and deeper into sin. You're grabbing hold of anything and everybody that, that you can find to keep you from going under. Confession's good for the soul. And I got a couple of minutes here. On senior day 1964, I decided to play hooky and go up to the lake. And, and we didn't have a boat, so we just kind of took the dock off of this man's <laughs> yard and floated out on the little lake there. Well, I could swim, but it's like a rock. You know, I, I just could swim. I would go straight down. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves about, oh, maybe three or 400 feet off of the shore. And I said, okay, that's great. Now, how are we going to get back? And some of them said, well, I can carry you back on my back. I'll carry you back. You just hold around my neck, and I'll carry you back. Listen, they had to knock me out to get me the back to the shore because I was trying to stand on everybody's head to get to the shore. You understand? I, I should not even be here tonight, and were it not for the grace of God, I wouldn't be. But that's where you are tonight. If you don't know the Lord, you have nothing to, if, sooner or later you run out of hedge, you run out of rock, and you're going to sink. You're out there on that ocean of life. You're sinking deeper and deeper into sin, and you're grabbing hold of everything that comes along. Well, maybe this is it. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the way. Uh, let me tell you something. On the authority of God's Word, let me tell you this. Right now, I'm going to throw you the lifeline of God's grace. It's right there in front of you right now. It's called the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, and the gospel. It is the power of God and salvation. It's right there. All you have to do is to believe it. And what does it mean to have faith? It means to take God at his word and act upon it. Let your hand of faith take hold of God's heart of grace, which is why he brought you here tonight to hear the sermon. Just turn loose and, and let God do it. Some of you are pastor, you're saying, Pastor, I want to believe, I want to believe, but I'm wavering. I'm, I'm still treading water here. Then cry out to God. If he's, if he's working on your heart and it evidences that you, he is because you're here, just cry out, God, give me the faith to believe in you. Give me the faith to trust in you completely, unreservedly. Uh, put your whole life in his hands. And, to say, and, and cry out like the man did in the Bible, Lord, I believe. But then he said, help my unbelief. So i got a question tonight. Do you believe God created the heavens and the earth? How many of you believe God created the heavens and the earth? Do you believe God created the, and everything that's in it? How many of you believe that tonight? Would you say yes or no or amen? Do you believe God delivered Jesus Christ to the cross as payment for your sins? Do you believe that God raised him from the grave to prove his power over? All right. Then let me, let me assure you tonight. He has the power to do something nobody else can do. No preacher can do it. No mama, daddy can do it. No evangelist can do it. He has the power to quicken your dead spirit just as he had the power to quicken the dead, physically dead bodies of Abraham and Sarah. And he can give you a new life. And he can cause you to be born again and to raise you from the death of your sins to give you everlasting life. Don't settle for the Ishmael of religion and the good works of the flesh. Trust God and God alone to give you new life by your faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, would you burn this message upon the hearts tonight? Would you etch it so that it cannot be erased? And Lord, may they have to deal with that before they can lay their bed upon the, night, on the, on the pit of the night in peace and rest. Would you let them see that there's no other way to be saved? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. But it was love that lifted me. Love lifted me. Next line says, what? When, sing it out, say it out loud, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Amen. Have a wonderful week. See you Wednesday.